Uh, I'm Bill Gerstenmeier, and uh, I'll talk to you this morning in the late-breaking uh, session about some uh, recent uh, design and mission decisions regarding the uh, multi-purpose crew vehicle and the space launch system. And then uh, I'll be followed by uh, the Chinese talking about uh, their manned space program. So I'll kind of flip through these charts pretty quick and uh, hopefully leave a little time for some questions before we get to the Chinese and, and their presentation. Um, this is basically the NASA vision and strategic goals. What we're really about with uh, MPCV, the multi-purpose crew vehicle and the space launch system, is uh, extending and sustaining human activities across the solar system. So again, the thing that's important here is we're not picking a particular destination. Uh, we're picking spacecraft that can support mul multiple destinations, multiple things, and be um, essentially used for multiple decades into the future. So we're going into this thinking not as a short-term kind of goal, but much longer-term goal uh, heading forward. Um, again, uh, the human spaceflight portfolio, it's uh, fairly diversified. Um, I won't really cover anything on here. You can just kind of read through these. You know, I think we begin with what we have in orbit today, which is the space station. Um, it's clearly a wonderful scientific laboratory, a technology test bed, an orbiting outpost, a galactic observatory uh, with the AMS. Um, we need to, and we're going to use the ISS to, to push some new technologies to see if we can actually use potentially some pieces of ISS for exploration. And it will definitely play a role in the ISS. Uh, ISS will play a role in exploration as we move forward. This is our capability-driven exploration. Um, again, we start out with initial exploration missions. We then uh, move to cislunar space between the Earth and the Moon. Uh, then we move out into the solar system and then eventually towards Mars and, and throughout the re remainder of the solar system. What's good on this chart is it shows some of the things you need to, uh, to do those various activities. You can see, like here, we need long-duration habitation uh, capability. We need some kind of high thrust propulsion system, or not necessarily high thrust, but high efficiency space propulsion system in this region to go beyond in that area. Um, and you could see here, if we're going to land someplace, we need some kind of landing capability here. So what this chart kind of shows on one place is the various functional pieces we need to actually put together a structural or architecture for, um, for uh, human exploration of space. And if you start all the way back here, all the way back here, two key pieces are we need a heavy lift launch vehicle that can take large mass to space so we don't have to fly multiple missions to assemble things. And then we need uh, some type of capsule that can support and return directly from these dis distances such as the moon, uh, Mars, and asteroids. You know, it's not effective to re-enter into the Earth's atmosphere to break, to break into low Earth orbit and then re-enter. The amount of propellant it takes to break into uh, Earth orbit is, is a tremendous penalty with, for you to carry that propellant all the way out into space with you, then return it for that, for that uh, need. Um, the, the two key pieces which I just described were the space launch system and the multi-purpose crew vehicle. And then we'll, we'll talk about how we're really moving out pretty heavily with both of these programs. We've been taking the existing programs that were in place and we're transitioning into these new programs. So we were able to capture a lot of the experience, a lot of the hardware from the previous programs and flow them into the new programs. So for example, under the space launch system, uh, we've, uh, we're going to use initially for the first two test flights the solid rocket motors. Then we'll go do a competition for boosters that attach on the side. And we just completed a developmental test firing of the solid rocket motors out in Utah. That's a five-segment solid. So that's complete and that's behind us. We're doing a lot of J2X engine testing at, uh, in uh, Michoud, at, and at Stennis, rather. And uh, those activities are going well. On the Orion capsule, We've done a lot of uh, acoustics tests in Denver. We've done some splash tests. We've done some launch abort tests. We've done some sea trials. We've done some parachute trials. So we're making tremendous progress with the, with the capsule and the Orion activities. 
And then down at the ground systems in Florida, we've done a lot of work there. We've got essentially the clean pad on uh, 39B. We've got fiber optics running out to the pad with uh, programmable load controllers sitting out on the pad so we can essentially adapt and support multiple launch vehicles that come out to the pad. Um, we're going to be able to use the uh, MLP, the, the uh, launch platform that was designed for Ares-1. We'll be able to use that for the new SLS system. So we have a tremendous amount of uh, hardware in place, facilities in place, and people in place to, to support the new systems as we move forward. Okay, the uh, multi-purpose crew vehicle uh, will be able to support the crew up to six astronauts on deep space missions. It could last anywhere from six days for a lunar flyby mission up to nine, 900 days for a Mars expedition mission and paired with additional propulsion and habitation systems. This is a, a breakdown of what's, what makes up the uh, multi-purpose crew vehicle. There's a launch abort system, um, and then there's a shroud that sits over the capsule, provides uh, protection uh, during a first stage of flight, um, and it jettisons after the first stage. Uh, there's the crew module, then behind that sits the service module, then there's a spacecraft adapter that interfaces with the rocket below it. So again, a lot of work has been occurring on the MPCV. The final welds have occurred down in New Orleans for the test flight vehicle. So this is tremendous progress moving forward. This is not a paper project in any way, shape, or form. This is real hardware getting put together by a very good team, and, and we're making tremendous progress on the Orion capsule. Again, there's a lot of technology in, in these systems. You know, we don't often think about that, but the propulsion system, this is the abort motor systems. Those are solid rocket motors that are actually pulsed to actually control the vehicle as it does the abort and to do a flip around. That's really state of the art to, to actually throttle solid rocket motors as they fire to do the abort. The avionic systems is state-of-the-art avionic systems. Communications are state-of-the-art structures. We're using uh, friction stir reaction, uh, we're using friction stir welding for the uh, structure, which is also state-of-the-art. Power systems will also be top-notch and first. Same with thermal protection system. The heat shield will be much better than anything we've flown in the past. The life support and safety systems are also very, very good and straightforward. The navigation systems are also, again, uh, the storm navigation system for rendezvous and prox ops is also brand new technology and very, very good. So the point is we're taking kind of the best of old technology, blending it with the best of new technology, and, and coming up with the designs to move forward. Again, these are, these are the pictures that I showed on the little insets of the, the progress that's occurred. You know, significant progress has occurred. The, the pad abort test was flown in uh, uh, White Sands, New Mexico, and that was a very successful test. Uh, showed that we could do a pad abort. And that was a tremendous uh, accomplishment. The acoustic chamber testing in Denver is going extremely well. It's uh, showing that our models are pretty correct, and there won't be major work, rework re, re, uh, required to make any changes. If anything, we're learning. It's all going extremely well. And we've been doing quite a bit of recovery ops to make sure we can, we're not going to get surprised later when we actually get into flight. Um, you know, again, these are the major milestones. I won't read these to you, but um, they're basically uh, some parachute tests, some heat shield integration, um, and then some tests of the mating of the launch abort system with the vehicle. Space launch system, again, it's designed to carry the Orion MPCV cargo and equipment and science experiments to Earth orbit and destinations beyond. Uh, the SLS will have an initial lift capability of 70 metric tons, but we're going to design it such it can go to 130 metric tons, which will be a very uh, uh, much bigger than Apollo was. Um, it'll use a liquid hydrogen oxygen propulsion system, the RS-25D. Those are the shuttle main engines. And the, shuttle, and the shuttle program for the core stage and the J2X engine for the upper stage. And the SLS will initially use solid rocket boosters for the first potentially two developmental flights, and then we'll go compete the boosters that get attached to this rocket uh, for the subsequent flights. And those could either be a, a liquid system, ox kerosene, maybe ox hydrogen, or even a solid system. But we're going to have to go do that. And the challenge will be can we design the core vehicle such it can attach different uh, 
different boosters to the side, and that'll be our overall design change. So again, you can see here we're picking up a lot of heritage from other programs. Having 15 shuttle main engines with over a million seconds of test time is a tremendous advantage to us. That allows us to phase that engine development out a little bit. The J2X work, which was going on previously for the upper stage, that's going extremely well down in uh, New Orleans. So we're able to continue that activity and keep it moving forward. And then the, the core stage activity, we're going to use the work that we had done on the upper stage where we looked at the vertical assembly of the tankage and we're going to design the upper stage and core to be manufactured with the same type of uh, techniques into the same facility. So therefore, if we don't need an upper stage for certain missions, we don't have to fly an upper stage. We can just add it in for essentially marginal cost to the upper stage. We don't have to bring in a new plant, new facilities, and new tooling. It'll actually get produced by the same tooling that builds the core. So we think that gives us a flexibility to add upper stages when they're needed and not have upper stages when they're not needed. The other big thing about this vehicle is not only is its lift capability, but its fairing size. It, it can have anywhere from an 8-meter fairing to a 10-meter fairing. And we think that has tremendous applications for programs even beyond human spaceflight. So hopefully we'll, we'll have this rocket available for others to go use. This is a comparison of uh, the, the two configurations. The, the one on the left is the, uh, is the 70 metric ton version and the one on the right is the uh, 130 metric ton version. Um, I think you can see really the big difference is the upper stage sits sits in there and the other thing is that the solid liquid or rocket boosters will sit on the side and that'll be the challenge is to figure out how to attach that booster system to the core and make it interchangeable. Again uh, we're building on the hardware even for the uh, SLS and PCV. Uh, you can kind of read through all this we like I described to you earlier we're actually in wind tunnel tests now with the rocket which is which is very good. We've been using modern manufacturing uh, for many of the components um, and, and you can just uh, read through these charts. But uh, a lot of good data and work has been done. Again, this is the developmental motor firing three, which was recently done in Utah. We had planned to do another developmental motor firing four. It looks like we will not have to do that firing now. The data has been very good for us, so we'll go directly into qualification firing. So we'll do two qualification firings and then get ready to go to actual flight units. So that's a big plus for us that we're going to be able to move out on the solid rocket motors without much additional investment. Again, some of the major milestones. Uh, we're in the wind tunnels now uh, doing some analysis of the rocket. We did an industry day with uh, our contractor partners to make sure we're ready to go do this from a contracting standpoint. And we've got a lot of J2X engine testing going on down at, uh, down at Stennis. So again, if you step way back, there's lots of potential destinations out there, many exciting things to go do. The first two vehicles you need to do those things are the heavy lift launch vehicle and the Orion capsule. We've got a solid design moving forward on both of those. We're going to move fast on both of those projects, and we'll be ready to go deliver those as we move forward. So thank you for uh, your attention today, and uh, that concludes my talk. So I think I have time for maybe one or two questions, if somebody wants to ask any questions. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it turns out that we'll need, for the comp to get to 130 metric tons, we're going to have to actually redesign the five-segment booster as well. We'd have to go to potentially a composite case away from our steel case to gain some weight, and we might need to make a propellant change um, where we use the more energetic propellant uh, that, that sits in the solid rocket motor. So even if we go continue with solids, we're going to have to make a, a pretty significant upgrade to the solid rocket uh, booster segment. We're thinking right now that we will do that first competition for those, uh, for those booster activities starting this December. We'll put out a, a contract to do some developmental work for about a 30-month period, 
and then we'll follow that up with a full-up competition. And our idea there is we're not sure that we're really ready to step up to the booster activity right away with a full-up competition. We think there's some technology that needs to get uh, explored and understood as we go forward. We think we also need to define a little bit better the core interface for the solid rocket boosters or the liquid rocket boosters, so we have that as a design condition. So we're going to have kind of a study phase with uh, potentially multiple contractors participating in that study phase for a period of about 30, 30 months or so, and then uh, we'll then roll right into the, the actual competition. But the idea is to have the, the new booster system available in about the uh, probably 2019 time frame. I don't remember the exact thrust levels. I, I can get that for you. Yep, and one more. Yep. Uh, Bill, about the interchangeability of the boosters that you mentioned, is, is the thought that we'll go to a singular solution after the competition or that in the future the program would carry multiple providers of different types of boosters for different applications? I think the thing is if we realize our, our vision, we'll have an interface that's generic and we'll be able to carry potentially different boosters and change them out as needed. So we could go compete in the future, maybe downsize if something's easier for a mission that requires less thrust, et cetera. So we'll think we have some variability there. So if we do our job right, we'll have the ability to, to change the boosters that sit on the side. So that's our, that's our ultimate goal. We're not going to pick one and then move in one particular direction. All right. So I'll, I'll turn it now over to the Chinese, and thank you for your attention.